Good morning, everybody. Welcome again to the third week of the new series we started, The Jesus We Never Knew. You see, when people hear the name Jesus, they normally relate it to religion. Jesus Christ is known to be the founder of Christianity. And Christians are believed to be those who believe Jesus Christ and follow his teachings. But is that what Jesus really came to do? Did Jesus really only come to give humanity a set of code of ethics on how to live and how to treat each other? Or did Jesus come to make bad people good? You see, Jesus, as recorded in the New Testament, was very clear about his identity and his mission. And it was important for him that his followers who knew him knew exactly who he was and why he came and what he came to do. Now, everything that we need to learn and everything to be learned about Jesus has already been revealed to us in the Bible. We have what we need to know about his identity, who he is, his life, and his mission. Now, Hebrews 10, 9 gives us one of the main reasons Jesus came. It says there, Hebrews 9, 10, I'm sorry. It says, for the old system dealt with only certain rituals, what food to eat and drink, rules for washing themselves, rules about this and that. The people had to keep these rules to tie themselves over until Christ came with God's new, better way. With God's new and better way. Now, I'd like for you to hear that last statement. Christ came with God's new and better way. Now, think about this. Up until this time, when Jesus came into the picture, people thought that the way you rightly relate to God is keeping a hundred of rituals and rules. Now, there are about over 600 rules in the Old Testament that they had to follow in order to relate to God. In our session last week, we talked about how the religious leaders at that time were so upset that Jesus and his disciples were eating with the tax collectors and the sinners. We studied about the calling of Matthew. At another time, they were so angry at Jesus because Jesus healed during the Sabbath, which was supposed to be a day of rest. You're not supposed to do anything on the Sabbath. At another occasion, they were so upset with Jesus and his disciples because Jesus' disciples did not wash their hands before eating. Right. And those were just a very small part of the hundreds of rules they strictly followed in order to, in a sense, be acceptable to God, to relate to God. So this was the mindset of the people when Jesus came into the picture. For thousands of years, they followed all these ceremonies and rules and rituals for them to be right with God. Now, some of these rules and ceremonies and rituals were actually instructions from God that he gave Moses. But through the years, the religious community, the religious leaders and authority started adding more rules, more rituals, and more ceremonies. And the rules have gotten longer and harder and almost impossible to follow. And they started to use these rules and rituals to basically control people, manipulate people into submission. They actually threatened people. We learn about Matthew, that Matthew was not allowed to go to the synagogue. He was not allowed to go to the temple. In, 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 our work, in our terms, he was not allowed to go to church, right? So these rules, they, they, the, the religious leaders at that time used the rules to threaten people that if they broke the rules, that they would never inherit heaven and that God would punish them. In other words, following all the rules of those times, the rituals instead of, was their way to appease God, was their way to access God, was their way to connect with God. Now today we're going to see, what we're going to see is this mind, mindset at play in another character who encountered Jesus. We're going to get inside, an inside look at his thoughts and beliefs of how to access God or how to go to heaven. In other words, how to spend eternity with heaven. Open your outline with me, pull out your outline with me and read in Mark 10, 17. Follow me as we read. As Jesus, as Jesus went out into the streets, a man came running up and greeted Jesus with reverence. Now the word means that he literally went down on his knees as a sign of respect and reverence to Jesus. And he asked, 
Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to get eternal life? Now, I'd like you to notice how he posed the question. He said, what must I do to get eternal life? Now, this has been the problem for those trying to connect with God through the ages. We all have this issue. We all have this belief this system. It is this belief that I have to do something and I have to do more and I'm never sure how much I should do or if I have done enough. For instance, for those of you who have athletic backgrounds or frame your frame of reference, you'd begin to think in terms of how many righteous points do I need to score in order to live forever with God in heaven? Or for those of you who come from the academic background, might ask, I wonder what the entrance exam is. I wonder if I'm able to answer all the right questions so that I can gain admission to heaven. Or for those of you who are religious, a church goer, you might think in terms of like, ah, how many times do I have to go to church a year? How many Bible verses do I have to memorize? How many mission services do I need to do? How many times a day should I pray? How, many, how, many, how, how much should I give? How much is enough? And what do I have to do? What else do I have to do? Now, fundamentally, that first question of the guy was already wrong. That was the wrong question, and we'll see that in a moment. Now, Jesus said to the man, keep reading with me. Jesus said to the man, why are you calling me a good teacher? No one is good, only God. You know the Ten Commandments. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, don't cheat, honor your father and mother. Now, notice what the, the, the young guy responded to Jesus. He said, teacher, I have from my youth kept all these rules, right? Now, notice this last phrase. I love this. Jesus looked at him hard in the eye and loved him. Now, I want to point this out to you. In a second, we're going to see that Jesus knew this man had not kept the commandment. Jesus knew that. But he said, if from the time I was a boy, Jesus, I followed all the commandments. Jesus knew he was not telling the truth. The first commandment this man had already broke, broken was don't have any other gods before, before. Don't have any other gods before God. And this guy had something in his life that was more important than God. So Jesus knew at that moment that this man was not really keeping all the rules all the commandments. But get this, the amazing part of that was even knowing that, notice what it said there in your, in your outline. The Bible says that Jesus loved him. Even though Jesus knew this guy is lying to his face, lying to my face, Jesus loved him. My life, I, I bet you many of us do not know this about Jesus Christ. This is one of the most extraordinary thing about Jesus that you will ever come to know. He knows everything about you, and yet He loves you. He loves you, the good, the bad, and the ugly. He loves you, and He knows everything, probably that you even know about yourself. Now, notice how Jesus responded to His response about doing everything that, that has been commanded. The next part in your outline, follow me. It says, Jesus said, there's one thing left. Now, here's, here's the game changer. Jesus said, go sell everything you own and give it to the poor and all your wealth will then be heavenly wealth and come follow me. The man's face, now notice how re he responded to what Jesus told him. The man's face clouded over. You know what that means? That literally means his face just dropped. This was the last thing he expected. Now notice what he, how he responded. He walked off with a heavy heart. He was holding on tight to a lot of things and not, and, and, and not about to let go. Looking at his disciples, Jesus said, Do you have any idea how difficult it is for people who have it all to enter the kingdom of God? or to enter God's kingdom. 
Now, what we're going to discover as we just walk through these verses is that this rich young ruler was holding on to three beliefs about God on how to relate to God and probably how, even how to, to have eternal life, how to go to heaven. And guess what? All three beliefs that he had were wrong. They were dead wrong. Unfortunately, many today carry the same belief and mindset when it comes to relating to God or going to heaven. Unless we are informed and educated and we really look to scripture, we will end up falling in the same mistake. So let's look at the three belief system of this rich young ruler. Belief mistake, belief that he has, but they were mistaken. Belief mistake number one. What I have is probably enough to have a right relationship with God and go to heaven. Now, if you read through the story, you'll have to admit that he did have a lot going for him. This story is actually told in the three books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. If you read all three of them together, you'll find these three words. He was rich, he was young, and he was a ruler. Now, those are three things you know about him, this guy. We don't know his name, but they describe him as that. First, he was rich. He had material possession. Now, oftentimes people will read the story in the Bible and come to conclude, see, I told you that money, money, and money is evil and money is bad. That is not what this whole story is saying and, and what the story is saying at all. There are some problems with our attitude towards money that can way be wrong, but money in itself can have some benefits. And I think we can all agree with that. We are also told that he was young. Now, that's a pretty wise young person to think about eternal life, right? Usually young people do not think about the life after here. Now, we're also told that he was a leader. Now, he, he, maybe he's a leader in the community or he was a religious leader. We don't know if it's a political leader. We don't know that. But this guy had something going on in his life. He had affluence and he had influence. Now, but we know a little bit more about him. We know that he was humble. The Gospel of Mark says when he came to Jesus, he fell at his knees right in front of Jesus and he asked this question about eternal life. It also teaches us about this man that he was spiritually sensitive. Now, a lot of people who are rich and young don't really think about eternity. But this guy wanted to know about life after death. He wanted to know how to have eternal life. And he was very specific about it. He wanted to have a right relationship with God in heaven. We also know that he was a moral man. Jesus named four or five of the, te the Ten Commandments, and this guy said, I've kept all those, Jesus, since I was a little boy. He had a really good system. He had a good moral system in his mind of what was right and wrong, a system of morality that kept him together. Now, how many of you, how many of us could look at the Ten Commandments that Jesus listed there and say, I've kept all that, Jesus. I've always honored my mother. I've never told a lie. I've never stolen. I've never done anything wrong. Now, I don't think we can all say that, right? We have to admit that this guy did have a lot of things going in his life. He had a lot going for him. He, he easily could have believed what he has was enough to have a right relationship with God. At least that was, he was, that was what he was told ever since he was a child. But Jesus looked at the man and the Bible says he told him, son, you're still missing something. That's not enough. Now, at this point, the rich young ruler shifted to his second mistaken belief. He's thinking, okay, well, if I don't have enough, if what I have isn't enough, I can do more to earn my weight into heaven. I can do more to earn my, my way and my relationship with God. Now, it's clear from reading this story that this young leader at least suspected that morality and money and religion had its limitation and he still might need to do a little bit more. And thus he asked the question, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Somehow it, deep inside him, he realized his influence and affluence was still not enough. Now let me spend a moment defining this. 
All of us understand that sin would include all the bad things that we've done in our life. But that's typically where we stop. If, if you're doing bad things, yeah, you're sinning, you're sinning. But we say that what sin is all the bad stuff we've done, it's true, that's sin. But guess what, you know what? Sin is also all the good things that we fail to do. I'll repeat that. We always think of sin as just the bad stuff, but sin is also the good that we fail to do. For instance, the Bible says, be gentle. And every time I am very less gentle, the Bible says, I'm sinning. The Bible says, be forgiving. And every time I do not forgive, I'm sinning. The Bible says, be patient, be kind. And any time I'm not doing that, I'm sinning. Now, how many of you have ever had a problem of patience? I do sometimes and I'm still working in it. How many of you will always tell the truth? All of us that all of us know that we have all sin in our life. We have so much sin, it's, it's like a big wall that's been created between us and God. Now notice what, how Isaiah described this condition. In Isaiah 64, 6, he said, we are all infected and impure with sin when we proudly display our righteous deeds. We find they are all but filthy rags. Now notice that word all, we're all infected and impure. And in Romans 3, 23, Paul wrote, for all have sinned, for we all have sinned, and we fall short of God's glorious standards. So we had to agree that we're all in the same boat. Romans 3, 23 says, we all fall short, right? Let me illustrate what I mean by that. See, the rich young ruler had tried so many ways to get to God. It's kind of like trying to jump the Grand Canyon from the North Rim to the South Rim. Some people can jump farther than others, but the net result will always be the same. You're not going to make it. Now, this guy had tried to get to God by keeping a lot of rules. This guy had tried to get to God by following a lot of rituals, a lot of ceremony. Now, a ritual is something you do over and over again and finally hope it's enough, right? Now, he said, I've been keeping this rule since I was a little boy. He'd also tried religion because he obviously knew the Ten Commandments. So he was, really, he was a very religious guy. But guess what Jesus said to him? I'm sorry, it's not enough. Now, all of our good deeds, stack them together, fall short, simply not enough. Notice what Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 10. He said, God save you by his special favor when you believe and you cannot, credit, you cannot take credit for it. Now notice that it's not what we do. We cannot say, God, I did this. God, I did mission trips. God, I served. God, I gave. God, I was at church every day. God, Paul said, God save you by his special favor, by his grace. When you believe and you cannot take credit for this. Now notice his last statement there. It is a gift from God. It's a gift. Now notice what he said. He says, salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. No, why? So that none of us can boast. Since our rules and rituals and re religion won't get us to God, God had to come to us. So he came to us in his son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ becomes our bridge. He is our bridge to connect us to God and to bring us to heaven. Now, when Jesus died on the cross, he did not die for any sins that he committed. The Bible says that he, was with, he, was, he did not sin and he had no sin. When Jesus died on the cross, which we're going to celebrate in a couple of weeks. He paid the price of our sins. He took the punishment, which is eternal death, that you and I deserve for our sins. And he paid the price and he canceled it. Now hear me out here real quick. This is the fundamental difference between religion and Christianity. See, religion wants you to do things. Religion is all about doing. Christianity is about what already has been done by Jesus Christ. It's a relationship. It's about what God had already done in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, notice how Paul wrote this in Romans 3, 21 and 22. He said there, but now God has shown us a different way of being right in his 
in his sight, not by obeying the law. Remember, we talk about the old way, the old system. Paul said, that's rules, rituals, and religion. But the way promised in the scripture long ago, we are made right in God's sight when we trust in Jesus Christ. I'd like to, for you to hear that. We are made right in God's sight when we trust in Jesus Christ to take away our sins and we, can, we all can be saved the same way no matter who we are and no matter what we've done. Think about that. Think about that encounter that Jesus had with magic. Isn't that a great verse? You can be saved no matter who you are and what you have done. You accept Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross as a proof of God's love for you. And you receive it as a gift, that gift of forgiveness and eternal life as a gift just because he loves you. Now, this young ruler believed that he could do more to get to heaven. But he was wrong. Have you ever had that thought? Maybe I could do more. Maybe I should do this more. I actually had someone come to me. He said, how can you say that? Simply to believe. I have to do something. Of course, like if making a piece someone I have offended, I have to do my part. Are you that kind of person? Are you that kind of maybe a seeker who think that I have to do more? Now, here's the belief mistake number three that the, the, the rich young ruler, ruler have. He believed, okay, I believe I can trust Jesus with part of my life and still be completely right with God. Now, have you, been, have you ever been curious about why some people can go out on a Friday night and get like totally dead drunk and then come to worship service on Sunday morning and worship and they don't see any contradiction between the two. Have you? Or why a spouse can sit weekend after weekend next to, his, to their spouse in church while Monday to Friday carry on an affair with a coworker that isn't, and it isn't really bothering them at all. Now, I want to say this. We see this all the time, and maybe we think like this. Okay, God, as long as I show up there on Sunday, I know, let me take care of the rest of my life. Now, we have celebrities and people in high profile in society who calls themselves Christians and maybe even leaders in Christianity or followers of Christ, but live in complete opposite to the teachings of Jesus Christ. Now, do you know why that happens a lot in our culture? Because in our culture, we have learned that and adopted to live what I call a compartmentalized life. We have a church life, a work life, a sports or hobby life. We have a church language. Uh, we have a language in front of our kids. We have a language at work. We have church behavior, work behavior, and all these other things. We have come to falsely believe that as long as we give God a certain part of our life, that we, as long as we give God some realms in our life, we have the right to hold on to other parts of our life. And God doesn't have anything to do with those. Friends, can I say this? This kind of mentality is such the enemy of a life, a true follower of Jesus Christ. It is wrong. It is a mistaken belief. Many religious people believe that as long as they go to church, they pray, they read their Bible, they pay their tithes and, and help others, that they can do whatever they want to do in their life. And I've heard people say, well, you know what? We're all under grace. We can do whatever we want to do with our lives. Friends, can I say this? Listen to what Jesus Christ says in Matthew 7, 21, when he was talking to his disciples and all those who were there. Now, notice what he said. He said, not all who sound religious are really godly people. They may refer to me as Lord, but still won't get to heaven. For the, for the, deci for the, for the decisive question is whether, now notice this, the decisive question really, the bottom line is this, whether they obey 
my Father in heaven. Now, the rest part of that verse, Jesus was actually talking to the religious people and say, you know what? There will be people who will come to me in, in the final moment in heaven and say, Lord, didn't we cast demons in your name? Didn't we perform miracles? Because out of your name, God, we did all these things under your name. And Jesus will tell them, I never know you, you workers of evil. Now, I'd like for you to think about this. Jesus is either Lord of all or not Lord at all. That's, that's simply how it is. Jesus in another confrontation with, religious, with the religious crowd and the leaders described what religious people do. He said this in Matthew 15, 18. These people, they honor me with their lips and their ceremony, but their hearts are far from me. They honor me with their lips. Maybe they memorize scripture. Maybe they're very good in, in worshiping. Maybe they're very good in, in just doing all the, the rituals and ceremonies. But Jesus said this, their hearts are very far from me. Friends, can I say this? That's what religion does to us. Religion gives us the form, but it doesn't give us the transformation. Religious, uh, religion, religion gives us all the rules, but it doesn't give us the power. If Jesus Christ is God's son, think about this. If he died on the cross to prove his love for you, if he rose from the dead, proving his identity and his power, wouldn't you agree, wouldn't you agree, process this for a while, that he deserves our full devotion? Think about that. Here's what 2 Chronicles 16, 9 says. The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose heart are fully committed to him. Friends, can I say this? Jesus wants all. It's not just, okay, God, you can have this room in my life, but the rest is mine. Jesus, uh, Matthew wrote this. And Matthew, of all person, right? Of all the disciples, he wrote this. Seek first, Jesus. Seek the kingdom of God first. Put him first in your life. He wants to be the only one you serve, friends. He wants to be the only leader, and he wants it all. He wants you to trust him with all your life. Now, who's asking me to do this? Who's asking me to surrender my entire life to him? I'll tell you who. The one who loves you most and cares for you in unfailing ways. The one who promised to never leave you nor forsake you. The one who promised to take care of you while you're here in the side of life. And the one who says he's going to take you to live with him in eternity. That you do not need to be separated. I'm going to take you in heaven to live with me in eternity. That, my friend, is the one who's saying to you, I want you to follow me with all your life. Now, guess what? The rich young ruler was living his life. He had all the religious forms, all down to the T. But he didn't want to give his whole life to Jesus Christ. He simply just want to give a part of it. He thought that that would be enough. But he was wrong. It was kind of sad because notice his reaction in that encounter. The man's face clouded over. Now, this was the last thing he expected to hear. And he walked off with a heavy heart. He was holding on tight to a lot of things and not about to let go. Wow. The Bible tells us that when Jesus touched that one realm of the rich young ruler's life, his face was downcasted. He had a heavy heart. This was the last thing he expected to hear. And it says there he walked away with a heavy heart. He was unwilling to give Jesus Christ that area of his life. The young rich ruler turned away and walked away sad. Can I say this? If you followed the life of Christ, and it says there were lots of people who followed him, there were lots of people who were just following him, but you know, there, was, there were instances in the story of Christ where it says, and people left because they could not handle the teaching because it was a hard teaching. The, yacht, the rich young ruler turned away and walked away. 
It was the poet who told us the saddest words that have ever been penned are these words, what might have been. I look at this rich young ruler, his head down, and he's walking away from Jesus Christ and can't help but think about him. When I was studying this, I paused and I'm like, man, we learned about Matthew and Matthew took off, left his job, left everything and followed Jesus Christ without second thought. And now to these days, we're still talking about Matthew. Now to these days, we read about him. He became a church leader. And I cannot help but think about this rich, young ruler and think about what might have been. He might have become the best friend of Jesus. He might have been an eyewitness to the resurrection and the ascension of Christ. He might have become one of the early church leader. He might have had eternal life with God in heaven. But instead, he walked away because he only wanted to give Jesus Christ a part of his life and not all of it. Now get this, at the end of the day, friends, Jesus wasn't really interested in the man's money. It wasn't really about him selling everything to give to the poor in order to gain eternal life with God. That was not what Jesus was after. Jesus what was after what, what he really wanted from this guy, was his love, his undivided devotion, and his heart. See, the very first command was to love God with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, and all our strength. Now, here's what I'd like for you to hear very clear, clearly. Because some of you are probably having more questions. Around, you know, what about following? The, uh, am I not supposed to do this? Yes, you are. But follow me in this. You see, when that shift happens, when relationship replaces religion, there's a big change in your relationship with God. I want to say this again. There has to be a shift that takes place because many of us have really followed rules and ceremony. I did that. I, was, I grew up in church. I followed. I know all the protocols. I know all the songs. I know the verses. I know the story in, in sequence in Scripture. I read a lot of Bible. I know the life of Christ. I've studied about Him. But here's the difference. I had religion at one point in my life. But when I begin to shift, instead of following the rules, now I follow the rules. I follow the commandments. I do the ceremonies. I keep the special day. Not to earn points with God or to make God love me more or to, to make God smile and make God happy and make God really just bless me. Here's the difference. Now I worship, now I pray, now I go to church, now I read my Bible, now I feed the homeless, now I help the poor, now I give with generosity. Not because I want to earn God points with God, I do it now because I love God with all my heart, all my mind, all my strength, and all my soul. So here, follow me here. When you shift from religion to a relationship with Jesus, that's when you enjoy the journey. That's when you can count it all joy when you are going through trials and difficulty. That's when you enjoy being in God's presence. That's when you can't wait to read his love letter to you. That's when you never stop talking to him throughout the day. So, oh, God, look at me. God, oh my gosh, Lord, look, at, I'm about to take the test. Lord, would you help me? That's when you begin to carry a conversation. That's when you can sing your heart out and worship in total abandonment. You see, friends, this relationship starts with you jumping all in. It came down, this guy, to the, the rich young ruler, it came down to the battle of the wheels. You know what being strong-willed means, right? This guy was saying, God, I, I want to go to heaven. I want to be yours. I want to do this. But God, I am not ready to give this part of my life. I think we all know that there's this raging war that's just going on inside us, right? A battle like a spiritual tug of war. The rich young ruler is saying, this is what I want. But Jesus said, I know, 
but this is what I want. And it boils down to the battle of the wheels. You see, when you come to Christ, it's like you surrender to him and say, Jesus, I'm all in. I'm coming in. You take me just the way I am. You know my weaknesses. You know my doubts. You know my hesitation, God. I'm not even sure what all this means right now about fully surrendering everything to you. But I know one thing, and I know for sure you love me. You died for me, and you want my sins to be forgiven. And you're there. You're giving all this free to me. That's all I know right now, God. Maybe you're saying, I don't really know this whole surrender deal. But you say, God, I want my sins forgiven, and I need you to lead me. I give you everything. In that moment, you surrender your will. It's not, God, okay, I want, this is what I want. It's, God, what do you want for my life? What is it that you want? What is your purpose? What is your will in my life? Now, I'd like to say this. For those of us who have been following Jesus Christ for a lot of years or a lot of months, that battle of the wheel, friend, doesn't stop when you come to Jesus Christ. We all know, have, we all have those moments where we say, God, I completely surrender. Come one week, come one. There are still moments when I want to take it back. I want to take it back instead of God's way. I want to do it my way. You know, I, I like the illustration. I always hear when, when I was in youth ministry and I was attending conference, one of the speakers said, you know what, it's like, you know, you're driving, and now Jesus come in and said, now would you trust me to drive your life? Because I have a plan, I know the way, and I know what can save you from a lot of pitfalls and a lot of hard work. Now, would you let me drive? And I said, wow, God, that's awesome, that's awesome. Okay, Jesus, go, go ahead and take the driver's seat and, and drive me, God, drive me, and I'll go where you want me to go. And then after a while... We begin to take hold of the driving seat and we push Jesus out of the way. And Jesus is saying, wait, I thought I'm the driver. And I know God, but I know where you're taking me. I don't want to go there. When I was in the youth ministry conference session, maybe 35, 40 years ago, one of the speaker in his concluding statement said to us as youth workers right now, I want you to think about this. Bow your heads, close your eyes. And he told us ahead of time, I'm going to ask you something. And if you're not willing to do it, please don't stand. And if you are, stand on your feet. And then he said this, if in your heart right now, you can say, God, I want to say to you, God, anything, anytime, anywhere, with anyone at whatever cost, I'll do it, God. He said, if that's what you're willing to do, if that's in your heart, stand up. And I remember sitting there and quietly wrestling, and there's this tag of war, because I know my dad had told me, Phoebe, when you give something to God, don't take it back. And whatever you promise God, do it. And I'll have to be honest, I couldn't say the prayer. I couldn't even stand. I thought, oh gosh, if I say this, you might send me, God, to a place I don't want to go. You might send me to Timbuktu. You might let me do something I would not want to do God God I don't think I'm ready for this and I remember sitting in that chair just really torn in my heart in pieces and after a while you know I mean he said okay some people stood up and there were still a lot of us sitting down and I, and he said he said you know what thank you for being honest but I'm going to give you a few more seconds because this is a God moment. Whatever decision you make at this moment, you're going to remember this. And this is something that you're going to say. And, and you're not in your own youth group. You're not in your church. You are here with other youth leaders. And I'm asking you, are you willing to say to God, God, anything, anytime, anywhere, with anyone, at whatever cost, God, I'm all in for you. I remember that moment just breaking down, breaking down. Those are one of those defining moments in my life as a youth leader, as a youth pastor at the time. Now, if you would ask me at that moment, Pastor Phoebe or Phoebe, 
would you do anything God asked you to do? I said, yes. I, I challenge our young people, give everything to Jesus. Do what God wants you to do. I would have said yes. But you know what? At that moment, when reality began to hit me, when I have to stand before this pastor and in the presence of God and before these leaders, I was so, I was so hesitant. I sat down and I wept and I cried. And then finally, finally, God spoke in my heart and said, Phoebe, just trust me. At this moment, you can't leave, give it. But remember, I already started a work in your life and I will finish that work. So trust me. Go all in, Phoebe. This is the only way you can experience the life that I have for you, the purpose I have for you, the future I have. Go all in, Phoebe. Did you know at that moment, that space in that moment has exposed some areas in my life, some places within me that quite frankly were very shameful, very unpleasant to deal with. I started to see in my life over time, somehow I started to take it back. Some of the realms of my life that I thought God was in control. I saw some places of greed and, and maybe pride and ugliness and, and self-centeredness within me. And I was so ashamed about that. And I was thinking, God, oh my gosh, maybe I don't deserve to be your, your servant. Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm just not there because I'm not willing to go all in God. And that's when God reminded me, Phoebe, it's okay. All I want you to do is trust me at this time, go all in. You might not understand it, and I know your fears, I know, I know the things you're, you, you're afraid, but trust me this time, drop in my hands, give me everything. And at that moment, I remember I just cried and I say, God, I give you everything. I'm all in God, all the compartment of my life. And I wanna say this, that was the changing Place. That, was, that was the game changer in my life. And I remember I never came out the same. Now, I want to be honest with you, though. I'll have to tell you that since that moment, have I always let God take control of my life? Honestly, no. There were times where I wanted to take some realm of my life back, right? And I would say, God, I know you want me to do this, but Lord, this is, God, you want me to give this? This is all I have. And God said, remember that day. Remember when you said, God, I'm all in. Whatever, I, whatever you ask Jesus, I'm there. I'm going to give it. And I, I, I'd like to say, after this day, I mean, I'm growing there. I, I mean, when God says, let it go, Phoebe, let it go. I'm like, God, but you don't know what they've done. You don't know what they've said. And God says, let it go. Trust me. This is what it means to be all in with me, Phoebe. Now, when I think of that moment, I come to this, this, book, this, this verse in, in John 10, Jesus promised. And he said this. Jesus said, mark my words. No one who sacrifices house, brother, sister, mother, father, children, land, whatever, because of me, and the message will lose out. No one who sacrifices for me will lose out. Wow. I said, okay, God, okay, one is just this. I'm going to trust you. You're asking me to give this. You're asking me to let go. You're asking me to take a step of faith. So God, I'm going to do it because I know you promise. As long as I obey. I will not lose out. Now, I'd like to say this. For all of you who are watching, your heavenly father is waiting for you to let go of that thing that probably that, that's holding you back. Maybe some of you had been with us in the last few sessions. And you're thinking, wow, this Jesus person that I never know. The more I find out about him, the more this is so exciting. The more I love to listen about Jesus, the more I'm, I'm being drawn. Remember I talk about, for those of you who are seeking, those of you who are probably skeptics, and those of you who are cynic, and those of you who are Jesus admirers, at this point, let me ask you this. 
This is like the game changer now in your life. Jesus is asking you, what's holding you back? Are you like the rich young ruler who says, well, I've got my rituals, I got my, I got my rules, I got my ceremonies, I got my tradition. God, I, God, I'm good, I'm good. And I love to do this. I've been doing this since, since I was a child. Now you, you say, I just wanna, I just wanna love you. I wanna trust you, Jesus. Now, let me be very clear. It doesn't mean that you stop going to church. It doesn't mean that you stop doing all the things that are there. It's just that you need to stop changing the way you think and saying, Jesus, I'm going to give my life to you. I'm going to trust you completely. And I am doing this, God. I go to church. I pray. I f- do all these things that I've been doing since I was a child. Now, not because I want to earn points with you, not because I want to I wanna go to heaven, but now, God, I'm doing this because I love you. Let me say something for those of you who've been in your spiritual journey for quite some time. Let me ask you a very personal, poignant question. How is your walk with Jesus at this point? Has it become a burden? Has it become a dread? Has it, do you enjoy basically your spiritual journey or you are enduring your spiritual journey? Let me give you something to process and think about. Chances are you have shifted your thoughts. Probably you started right in the beginning. God, okay, Jesus, I give you my life. I trust you to carry me through. God, Jesus. And then pretty soon, pretty soon, you did all the spiritual disciplines, the devotions, coming to church, getting involved in ministry, and doing all this. And then you lost focus. Now it's not, Jesus, I'm doing this because I love you. Now it's like, Jesus, bless me. Jesus, I need a job. Jesus, oh, Jesus, I need, I, I need to be blessed. I need a new this. God, I need, a, I need a wife. I need a husband. Jesus, I need to do this. So guess what, Jesus? I'm just going to keep doing and doing all this so hopefully you can reward me for all my good works. Can I say this? I was at that point at one time in my life, and it was not a happy journey. I'd like to say this. If you have shifted, I think we all, we all have. It's okay. Jesus knows you've shifted. Jesus knows that you, you just want him for the blessing. You just want him for what, what you can get from him. Jesus knows that. And you know what? Remember how he looked at the young man? He looks at you right now. And he loves you deeply. And he tells you, I just need you to shift your thinking. You started out right, but just shift your thinking. Just love me first. Know that everything that you do for me is because you love God with all your heart. Let me ask you this. What are you holding on? What is it that you're holding in your life that that just you couldn't release to Jesus right now? Why? Why don't you pray this prayer quietly? Would you bow your heads? I wonder if you're ready right now to say, God, I'll follow you anytime, anywhere, doing anything with anyone at whatever cost, God. God, today, I am not holding back. I give you my everything, my future. My, my, my failures, my past, my relationship, my gifts, my talents, my assets, my material. God, I give you everything. Maybe you're like me. Maybe what God is wanting from you, what you've been holding back, is maybe a step of obedience. Maybe God is saying, I know you're doing all these things for me, but I'm putting my finger on this area of your life. Just obey me. Maybe God is saying, you do it, do it. Just obey me. This is a command. This is not a suggestion. You've got to forgive. You've got to let go. You've got to trust. How about taking that step of obedience? It might be just what Jesus is asking from you. Or maybe just saying, Jesus, oh Lord, I've followed you for many years, but I'm scared to get baptized. I know I made a commitment privately. I'm not quite ready to go public with you, Jesus. Maybe that's that. 
Maybe Jesus is saying, well, you know what? You've followed me for quite some time. Maybe now is the time. Would you follow me? Like, just like I was baptized in water, would you be baptized in water? I invite you to pray this prayer. First of all, for those of you who probably have never encountered Jesus Christ in a personal way, pray this prayer quietly. Say this, Lord Jesus, I come to you today and I realize that I have been religious all my life or I didn't believe in you. I had questions. Lord, I realize today that you have done everything for me so that I can receive eternal life. So, do not, so I do not have to fear death, so that I do not hope for eternal life, but you have promised eternal life when I put my trust in you and I believe in what you have done on the cross. So this morning, Jesus, I open my life to you and I accept your gift of eternal life. Thank you that I do not have to earn it. Thank you that I do not have to work for it. Thank you that I do not have to bribe you for it. And this morning, God, in faith, I am receiving it as your gift of love to me. Forgive me, Jesus, of all my wrongdoings and my sins. Forgive me for doubting you. Forgive me for ignoring you. And Lord, as much as I know how, I don't understand this whole surrender deal, but I am taking my first step of surrendering my life to you. Jesus, I know you will help me do what you have asked me to do because you will start the work in my life. Jesus, I'm coming all in. I say I believe in you and I trust in you. In your name I pray. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you know where you are, and maybe you've taken the, you've taken the steering wheel back to yourself, you know what you need to do. Let me pray for you. God, for those of us who's been in this spiritual journey for a long time, or maybe just recently, God, and Lord, at some point in the journey, we have pushed you out of the driver's seat and we have started driving and you became a passenger. We ask you for advice. We look to you for blessing. We look to you for everything, God. But Lord, we have taken the wheel. Father, I pray, as you have reminded us this morning that Jesus wants it all. Lord, I pray that may we, re may we release that steering wheel and put you back, God, where you put you, Jesus, Lord, where you need to be because you have a plan for our life. You know the way, you know the truth, you are the way, you are the truth, and you are the life. God, for those of us who have lost our joy in our spiritual journey, would you please bring us back and align us to your truth so that once again, we can experience the joy of our salvation and experience God, the true presence of Jesus Christ in our daily life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you guys. Thank you so much for being with us. I can't wait to see you. Again, I'd like to say this. We are going to have our Easter session this coming April 17. And for those of you who are close around our area, come join us and be with us. I'd love to see you. Please introduce yourself to me if you've been watching us online. I'd like to meet you personally. And for those of you who are far from us, here's what I'd like you to do. Find a church. Find a, ch a church community where you can join with them in this amazing celebration of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God bless you guys, and I'll see you again next Sunday. I love you all. Sometimes on this journey, 
get lost in my mistakes What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength And my story isn't over, my story's just begun Failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does Yeah, failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does Shame at the door Cause it ain't welcome anymore Ooh, you're in the Father's house Arrival's not the end game Cause the journey's where you are Never wanted perfect, you just wanted my heart And the story isn't over, if the story isn't good And failure's never final, when the father's in the room And failure's never final, when the father's in the room Cynical fan 